Welcome back, guys. Yamaha Royal Star 1300. It's a V4. It's basically like a VMAX engine, same DNA. So I think same crank cases, same crank shaft, sort of the same. Barrels are slightly different because it's dressed up to make it look like it's air cooled, but it's essentially a VMAX engine. Um, this bike belongs to a subscriber of mine, lives down the other end of the country, and he'd watched the VMAX debacle. I'll put a link somewhere if you haven't seen that. might find that quite interesting. That goes on and on and on and on and on, that repair. But we did get there in the end. So if you haven't seen that, go watch that. So he'd watched that series of videos and he thought, oh, I think maybe Jim might be the man to try and fix this for me. So don't want to make it clickbaity, but it has been looked at by somebody else close to him where he lives. In fact, they've, they've had it twice. So let's get me story straight in my head. It's 27 years old. It's got a private number plate on it. I've just been and looked it up. So it's 27 years old and it's only done less than 5,000 miles so you can probably guess if you've watched any of my videos where this is likely to go but I'm not 100% certain because the story is it had stood wouldn't run properly went to this guy he had the carbs off cleaned the carbs put them back on you know the story wasn't running quite right guy sent it back he did some more jiggery pokery with the carbs apparently he was telling the owner that one of the slides wasn't opening properly when you revved it so he changed the diaphragm apparently anyway the guy had it back and then i can't remember whether it was i don't think it was running quite right and then it it um think jim it developed a completely dead miss on number four cylinder so one two three four so front right hand cylinder apparently has got a complete dead miss now Guy got his ass out with it and just put it to one side and anyway then he discovered me and he thought oh I wonder if maybe Jim could do something for me. Hopefully I can while well, I blow smoke up my own ass but I'll be surprised if I can't fix it unless there's something catastrophically wrong and he doesn't want to spend the money. At the moment when you turn the ignition on the, the fuel pump is going bonkers because he's drained the fuel tank and he drained the carbs because it was going to sit for a while, which was sensible. So I'm going to put some fuel in it. Let's fill the carbs up. Hopefully they won't piss fuel out all over the floor. Let's go from there. See where that takes us. Let's see what this dead miss is all about. And then we'll do the usual, maybe a compression test. And ah, if I seem wobbly, I've got a really bad back. I just ah, tweaked it then. Um, focus. Let's get some fuel in it and let's see where we end up. Right, so I'm only going to put a smidge of fuel in this spike because... Oh God, this can is full, my back. Ah, it's not going to need much, just enough so the fuel pump can suck. Did you notice in my intro just then, I did, don't think I dropped any F-bombs. Ah, my back's hurting. So... Hang on, I've got to focus. That's probably enough. I, uh, I do read some of the comments. What I tend to do is I pay attention to the comments for the first sort of day, 24 hours, and then I'm too busy to be reading comments, so I apologise. If you really want my attention, not an advert, but join the Discord, and that's where I spend most of my time anyway. I digress. So I did read some of the comments and they're like jesus jim the swearing is terrible and the one one of the comments that really caught my eye was i love this video and i really want to share it but too much swearing so i was like oh actually you have got a point because i was a little bit cringe when i edited it i was like wow you swear a lot even i was thinking that so i'm going to try and tone it down a bit you'll be pleased to hear you're still going to get f-bombs but i'll try and drop them only when necessary um right what's the filler cap oh my god i'm on a go slow today my back all right let's turn the ignition on i'll reposition the camera and let's see if fuel pisses out everywhere uh keyhole down here right let's move the camera 
Okay, prepare for leakage. Oh, hang on a minute, is the fuel tap on? Stand by. Uh, negative. Uh, put it on reserve. Right, go again then. Contact. Oh, it's making the right fuel pumpy noises. You have to, you only get a few seconds of prime, so you have to keep turning the key on and off. Uh oh. Is that leaking? And then you can hear, if I shut up for a minute, could you hear that? that sort of fuel pumps slow down, go click, 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 click. And if everything is working correctly, when you turn the ignition on and the carburetors are full, you won't get a prime because there's already fuel pressure in the fuel line going to the carburetors. Float needle valves are shut. So there's the, the, the way the fuel pump works, won't get into that, but you won't get a prime. With this design of fuel pump, one way to tell whether you've got leaky float needle valves is to turn the ignition on and off and listen to see if you can hear click, click, click from the fuel pump, which I am getting a little bit of. Anyway, there's nothing obviously leaking out. The danger with this design is because they're effectively downdraft, if you like. When the, when the fuel level in the float bowl comes up too high, it comes out of the pilot circuit and the, and the emulsion tube and main jet and drains down into the cylinders. Doesn't leak externally as much as a... I'm waffling. Let's, uh, let's push the start button and see what happens. The uh, choke is on this side. Ooh. Ooh. Fuck it out, it's quiet. I've been working on these loud motorbikes the last couple of weeks. It comes as a bit of a surprise when there's a quiet one. Well, that sort of sounds all right, but as I previously mentioned in other videos, these V4s are sort of notoriously difficult to... Hang on, let me, let me just listen, sorry. We're on sort of half choke at the moment. I put the choke all the way in. Yeah, these V4s are notori notoriously difficult to sort of hear a misfire. If you've got an inline four and you've got a cylinder that goes down, it's really, really obvious. But it's harder with a V4 engine. Let's do the old how hot are the exhaust pipes test. So the cylinder that was apparently dead was this, uh, this front one. If I just lick my finger and Ow, that's hot. That's definitely running on that cylinder. What about this one? Ah. Absolutely, completely and utterly stone cold. Right, what about the other side? Sizzle, ow. Ah, yeah, sizzle. Okay, so it's number three cylinder. And it is properly dead. It sounds... I'm not sure that's coming out on the mic. Sounds kind of vacuum leaky to me. A real sort of sucking sound. Can you hear that? Anyway, what's the next step, guys? You know where we're going. Let's just pull the spark plug out of that dead cylinder. Have a look at the plug, compression test, etc. And it, it really is worth noting that I mean, that's on three cylinders. So even to a trained ear, it sounds really good. If that was an inline four on three, you'd be like, whoa, that doesn't sound very happy. But you don't know what you're listening for. Yeah, you licky, licky exhaust pipe. That's the way to go. Um, right, let's pull that spark plug out. Now then. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, you've got to get busy with an airline. Oh, is that water or dust? No. That is... Oh, no, it's water. Um, I know you think it won't happen to you, but... Fuck! 
here now, I suppose. I'm sorry, that did warrant an F-bomb. If your wet wipes are offended by that, then you don't want to be watching my videos. Yeah, airline round the plug, because one of these days you'll think, oh, it won't happen to me. There'll be a bit of grit in there. It'll drop down inside a cylinder and you'll be having a very, very, very bad day. Right, let's get this plug out. Oh, don't make me take the... Are you having a giraffe? Surely that'll go in there, yes. Right, where's me rat shit? Gone, there it is. This ratchet is an old Sykes Pickerman ratchet. It's, it's had a scaffolding pole on it. It's had all sorts of horrible things done to it. I love this ratchet. I've had it since I was 12 years old and I'm 50 now. It's never been a part. It gets used almost on a daily basis. They don't make them like they used to, I tell you. Right. I wonder, is this plug soaking wet? Or what? Oh yes, absolutely ringing. Right, are we getting this? So, what I'm going to do, but well, you know what I'm going to do, if you've watched any of my videos, plugs out, so let's just put a compression gauge in there. I'm not going to do all four cylinders. I'm 99.999% certain it's not mechanical. This thing's got 5,000 miles on it. It's just not going to be. But while the plug's out, it's an extra 60 seconds to do a compression test and you could save yourself hours going round in circles. So I'll disable the ignition somehow. I'll pull the other plug caps off possibly, which isn't the best way of doing it, as I've previously discussed, so it doesn't start. Let's Stop waffling and do it. Let's do a compression test. Right, compression test. So I've got the HT leads disconnected on all the cylinders. Do as I say, not as I do. That's not really the correct way of stopping the engine running. You're technically, you're stressing the ignition coils by, you know, allowing, allow, allowing, that's not a word, allowing the voltage to build up in the coils and not have anywhere to go, if you like, in layman's terms. Really, you should be, uh, what to say, some bikes will, if you turn the kill switch off, they'll, in fact, I don't think this is the case. It might, might even be, actually. Will it crank with the kill switch off? No. So some bikes, when you knock the kill switch off, which, you know, disables the ignition system, they'll still crank on the start button. This isn't the case. So you've got to stop it from starting when you're doing a compression test. So I've got the HT leads unplugged. Really, you should be unplugging the, the primary side, the low tension side. So, have you heard these words banded around? High tension and low tension side, or primary and secondary side? So that refers to, oh God, rabbit hole alert. When you've got an ignition coil, the ignition coil has... Oh, do we want to do this now? The ignition coil has two sets of windings in it, so you have a primary winding and a secondary winding. The secondary winding is what's connected to the spark plug wire, the HT lead and the plug cap. The primary so flip a neck. Inside an ignition coil you've got two sets of windings, a primary and a secondary. The primary is connected to the low tension side, so the low voltage side. The secondary is connected to the high tension, the high voltage side. You want to be disabling the low tension side, so that's the thin wires go into the ignition coil, so I nearly went down a how does an ignition coil work rabbit hole then, I've stopped myself. Right, because that's not what this video is about, so ignition on. You must always give an engine, you can't see the throttle, can you? You've got to give it full throttle, so it's volumetrically as efficient as it can be. Yeah, as, as predicted. Loads and loads and loads of wind. Right, the next thing, because the spark plug is so minging, I'm going to put a new plug in it, and then we're just going to reassess, uh, because it's clearly not going to run on that wet spark plug. I want to see what it's going to do with a fresh plug in it before I go any further. Let's put a new plug in it, 
connect all the HD leads back up and let's see where we are. Right, I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking, well, Jim, what about Spark? Good point. So the test that everybody would do would be to rest the spark plug on the cylinder head like this, ground it out and crank it. Oh, not the camera. Can I get you a bit closer to that so you can see it? Maybe not. Uh, so hang on, let me try and get you closer. Oh, what awesome camera work. Come on, focus. Focus, you can do it. I don't know whether you can see that, but there is a spark, okay? Um, right, let me pop you back down there. So, that's the test, isn't it, that you, you see everybody do. Rest the spark plug on the... Ground the spark plug, is there a spark? Yes, there's a spark. That's not really the full story, because... How to put this? Sparking at atmospheric pressure is way, way easier. Jumping that gap of the spark plug in this environment is a lot easier than in the combustion chamber in a high compression environment. You're not stressing the ignition coil or the high voltage side of the ignition system by doing, by doing this test. So you're only sort of getting half a story. Yes, you've got a spark, but is it strong enough? Now, you can get super complicated. You've seen me with an oscilloscope doing secondary ignition waveform analysis and stuff in the past, possibly. You could get super complicated. You could run it with your scope on the um, high voltage side with a with a inductive clamp. And you could also get even more complicated and you can have an amp clamp on the primary side and you can see the current flow into the current into the current. You can see the current flow into the ignition coil. So you can effectively see the dwell time of the coil and the time it takes to get saturated. I don't want to get into that it's more than, you know, we could do an hour long episode on ignition coils and secondary, secondary ignition. Can't even speak. What am I trying to say? You need to verify. We know now that it's mechanically good. The next thing we need to do is we need to verify the ignition system or as, as, as be as certain as we can that there's a good strong spark in the sort of compression environment. If you had your scope on the HT lead, you could literally see the burn time of the spark plug. You could see the dwell time, charge time of the coil. You could see the current flow into the coil. But you don't need to get that complicated for basic diagnostics. You've seen me use this jobby before, haven't you? And all this does is connects to the spark plug and then connects to, into the spark plug cap like this. And then this connects to the plug or grounds out if you like. And then you can just vary this gap. And I mean, it depends on the engine, but generally speaking, about a six or seven millimeter gap. So forcing the spark, the, it to jump a gap that's six or seven millimeters is about equivalent to what's happening at idle in the combustion chamber. So you're stressing the ignition coil by using one of these. So without getting all complicated with an oscilloscope, you don't need that. Let's use this tool. Fucking hell, waffle. Sorry, swore. swore. Get over it. <laughs> Let's stress the coil with this, and then we know that we've got a good enough spark, and then we're, we're going the fuel route then, aren't we? I mean, there are other things that could be wrong. Mechanically, the valve timing could be wrong, or but you've got to take each job as you find it, and this is a 5,000-mile bike that's never been apart, so it's, it's not going to be a weird valve timing problem or... You understand what I'm saying, don't you? Well, let's get this spark plug in. So I've got my tool in position. So this is the plug cap, HT side of the coil, high voltage side of the coil. It's got to jump this gap here. This is six or seven mil, about right. And then this wire here goes down to the spark plug. So contact. And we have got, can you see that? I'm not sure if the frame rate of the camera is gonna mess with it that sounds to me much nicer and uh, you can't see my hands can you but that pipe is now getting almost too hot to touch 
Interesting. So that sound, hang on, let me put you back down there. Let it up a bit. That sounds absolutely sweet. Okay. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, that's definitely red hot, that pipe. Okay. Hmm. While I'm thinking on that, I thought of something else. I misspoke a few moments ago and I, sorry, waffle hole. Uh, I said coil charge time, didn't I? That's a bit of a misleading statement. So what I meant by that was, uh, without having to explain how an ignition coil works, but the primary side of the ignition coil, so the side of the coil, you know, the two, you've generally got two little thin wires going to a coil, haven't you? So that's the primary wind, that's, they're connected to the primary winding. So when you turn the switch on, on your handlebar, you get a live to one side of the primary winding. And then the other wire, it's ground, this winding is what, what you would call ground side switch. So it's either switched by a transistor in the engine ECU, or if it's old school, by the, by the um, contact breakers, by the points. So when you turn your ignition switch on and you turn your kill switch on, you have a 12 volt positive live to one side of the coil. And then to get your spark, the engine ECU or your contact breaker points will ground this primary winding in the ignition coil. And when I said charge time, what I meant was it takes a while so this is an electromagnet. The primary windings connect to a coil inside, a coil of wire inside the ignition coil. You know what happens if you pass current through a piece of wire, you create a magnetic field. When you ground out this coil, crikey, crikey waffling, so you've got your live, when you ground out the coil, that magnetic field doesn't instantly build. It takes a while for that magnetic field, and we're talking a couple of milliseconds, we're not talking long, but it's not instantaneous. And you can see that actually, if you connected a current clamp to either the positive or negative wire of the ignition coil, you would see a current ramp. So you wouldn't see it immediate full current flow through the primary winding. You'd see the current flow slowly build. And that is, without getting really down a rabbit hole, that's because of a thing called back EMF, back electromotive force. So as the current is flowing through the primary winding and the magnetic field is building, that magnetic field that's building is also resisting the flow of current. So it takes a while. When you get to peak current flow, that's when you would sort of consider the coil to be charged, but that's just bad terminology. A better way of saying it is the coil is saturated, which means it's saturated in terms of the magnetic field fucking waffle sorry guys and that that did deserve an f word i'm not going to start apologizing every time i swear either that's going to get really annoying isn't it when you take the ground away the magnetic field collapses instantaneously or virtually and that's what gives you a spark that magnetic field as it collapses it passes the secondary winding I don't want to get any further into it than that but that's where you get your spark from it's effectively an amplifier anyway crikey why did I go down that waffle hole? Because I wanted, to, I'd, I'd misspoken and I'd said coil charge and that it annoys me when I hear other people say that, flipping neck. So what's going on? I've got a hot exhaust pipe and it sounds much better. <sighs> right, I've got to try and unpick this now, which is a bit difficult. So what's likely happened is my guess would be Remember earlier on when I said when these when these carbs overflow they flood the cylinder. I'm wondering if there's a, a sticky float needle valve in this carburetor and it's flooded this cylinder and you know the plug was completely soaked so it was never going to run on this cylinder. The next thing I'm going to do, because I know this bike's been messed with by, by somebody else, I'm going to put my vacuum gauges on the vacuum takeoffs and just see how well they're synchronized. I'm going to see where the mixture screws are and I'm going to give it a sniff of brake cleaner to check for vacuum leaks. Then I'll, if all that checks out okay, I'm probably going to ride it and see what happens because 
I don't want to spend the guy's money for the sake of it. It would be very easy, wouldn't it, to just tear into the carburetors. You've instantly got a £500 bill. And I, I don't want to do that. We've got to take this apart slowly, piece by piece, and try and figure out what's gone on. So, vacuum gauges next. Right, got me vacuum gauges hooked up, and I've got me brake cleaner bottle at the ready. I've just taken the little rubber caps off the idle mixture screw adjusty holes. What? I've, <laughs> I've taken the blanks out of the idle mixture screw holes so I can see where the screws are at. They're all, every carb is two and a half turns out, which is about right for one of these, so I'm not, yeah, nothing untoward there. Right, start it up. Yeah, I mean, you could argue, couldn't you, that it needs a tiny tweak, but there ain't a great deal wrong there. Now, we need to know whether we've got a vacuum leak, because let's just get busy with a bit of brake cleaner for a second. Ooh. Did that engine note change then? Yes, it did. You hear that, guys? Killed it. Okay, we have a vacuum leak. Now that's not to say that that's the reason why this cylinder was dead, because it's often the case with these things that there's multiple things going on. Uh, let me spray from the other side. And I can, I, I've said this before, haven't I, I think, in other videos, but you can often, you can have a vacuum leak that somebody hasn't noticed, and then you can synchronize the carbs compensating for that vacuum leak. So if you fix the vacuum leak, you would then find that the carbs were massively out of balance, out of synchronization. Um, I can definitely hear a sucking sound. Let me go the other side. Ooh. Okay. appear to be the problem cylinder. Okay, right. It it's quite hard to be precise, but it seems to be front left-hand cylinder somewhere, somewhere near where, can't speak, somewhere near where the carburetor joins, you know, at the, you know what I'm saying. There's a vacuum leak there somewhere, and then, let me turn it off and show you something else. So, I don't know whether you're going to hear this, but listen, ow, hear that sizzle. Okay, the original problem cylinder. I mean, I can touch that pipe. I mean, it's hot, hot, but it's not sizzle hot. It's not melty glove hot. Right, we've got more to unpick here. We've got potentially a vacuum leak on one of those two front cylinders. I think number two cylinder. If you're going to go after a vacuum leak on something like this, there's an O-ring where the rubber piece meets the cylinder head. I'll show you when we get it apart. That's a good spot for a... This is 27 years old. 
what am I trying to say? Get your words out, Jim. It's going to have to come apart now. We need to inspect these in... Jesus. Does that count as swearing? I think to some people it probably does, and I do apologise for saying his name. Um, let's get the carbs off. Let's inspect these inlet manifold rubbers. Potentially going to need new ones. And then there's something going on. It would seem... This, I can hold this pipe. There's something going on with the idle circuit on this carb. So, yeah. Quite a lot to unpick here. I think we'll probably call that the end of part one. Sorry, but if these videos go over 20 minutes from what I can see looking at the analytics, people's view... They, most people haven't got much of an attention span and the views drop right off. So apparently if I keep them to 20 minutes, people prefer that. So let's call it quits on this one. In part two, we'll get the carbs off. We'll have a look, see if we can see where there's a vacuum leak. We'll get these carbs apart, see if we can see somebody's cock up on this carburetor. I suspect probably, as is often the case, they just haven't been cleaned properly enough, but we're unpicking it slowly. Right, I appreciate you watching, guys. If you haven't subscribed, please do. If you can like the video, that'd be amazing if you sort of see some sort of value. And of course, if you really want to get involved with the conversation, have a look in the description. There's a motorcycle chat repair group in Discord that you can join. Loads and loads of service manuals that you can have access to free of charge, that sort of thing. Anyway, thanks again. See you soon.